All right. So last time, uh, we finished up talking about the well-separated pair decomposition. And we started looking at uh, some alternate ways that we could build something like a fair split tree. Uh, and the technique that we embarked upon but didn't finish was this uh, concept of using uh, this thing called a quad tree to replace a fair split tree for the well-separated pair decomposition. So today, I'm going to talk more about quad trees, maybe a couple of other odds and ends, depending on time. Uh, quad trees, I mean, as we already know, right? they're basically like the sort of recursive partition of space into these hypercubes, right? So you know, the idea is we recursively uh, subdivide uh, a unit square, right? So remember, these things all have to be bounded, our unit hypercube, into subcubes, right? So the kind of picture here is that we imagine that we start with some box, right, in 2D. We cut it into quarters, and then we keep cutting it down. So the idea is that we store our points for the quad tree in these, you know, leaf boxes, right? So the final tree itself is some sort of four-way tree where each node you know, subdivides the space into these four quadrants. Um, quad trees are pretty ubiquitous. I think there's probably a good chance everyone here has seen one of these before or at least heard of them before. Um, they're also often misapplied, right? So they don't, they are useful for things, right? There are problems that are important that can be solved efficiently with quad trees. And we're going to see a couple of them today. But there are also many more things that quad trees are often used for that they're actually not so great at. Uh, one example would be ranged queries, right? So if you have a range, you know, and you want to like search within some box over there, quad trees are not necessarily super helpful, and that's because we have to expand through all of these extra nodes in the tree, right? Um, so in analyzing, you know, the structure of a quad tree and the size of a quad tree, uh, there's sort of two or there's really only one parameter, right, which is actually the quotient of two parameters. So we have this thing called the spread, right? So we're going to say recall that the spread of a quad tree, or actually of a point set, right? So we're going to assume that this is a quad tree where we're basically sticking a bunch of points in it, and then we're going to just keep subdividing them until each leaf of this tree has exactly one point in it. And the spread is this quantity, which we're going to write as phi of p. And this is equal to the diameter of the point set divided by this thing I called the resolution of the point set, um, which is just sort of a you know, more convenient way of writing uh, the max distance between any pair of points, p and q, and p. So we basically take any pair of points, p and q. And then we find the closest not equal pair of points. So find some pair p not equal to q and p and find the closest pair, right? <clears throat> and uh, as we saw yesterday, that the height of a quad tree is order log of the spread. And the size uh, is order n log spread, which is not great, really. But um, we will see today that we can basically fix this size parameter. So we can actually upgrade this to order n. Right? The height is still going to be possibly log of the spread. But we'll show how you can kind of work independent of the height, however you want to do it. Um, and we'll see a couple of things that we can do with this structure. Right? So in and of itself, this is just a thing. I haven't told you anything that you can do with it yet. Right? Um, so, OK. Uh, so the first kind of thing that we're going to look at here is how you build a quad tree in the first place. Well, this is actually easy. right? You just start at the root and insert a point incrementally until you locate it within the tree. And then you stick a leaf there. So it's just keep on inserting the points until you finally get to a node that's empty. Stick the point inside the empty node. So, so far, so good. right? Um, yeah, so let's 
Let's now look at this size problem, right? So okay, so we can build these trees by sticking points into them incrementally. How do we sort of optimize this, right, or get rid of this log phi sitting around there? Well, let's kind of draw a picture of what this looks like. So suppose I have a quad tree like this, all right? Um, and I stick in this pair of points, which are very, very close together. And so what goes awry is that I have to keep subdividing this thing recursively over and over ad nauseum until I eventually get down to this like leaf, you know, many, many layers down on this tree, right? So if I draw a picture of what that tree is going to look like, the resulting structure is going to be something like this. So I'll have a root which comes out here, right? And then maybe I'll have another set of four leaves coming out here. Etc. maybe many, many levels. And then finally at the bottom, I have my two points right there. Right? So there's all of these useless levels in this tree sitting here doing pretty much nothing. Right? So uh, what we're going to do to fix this situation is we're going to take all of these extra intermediate levels in the tree and then just get rid of them. Right? So we're going to squish it into a single node. So the idea is we'll take our initial quad tree. We can just build it however we want. And then we're going to have this compression process where we're going to take all of these you know, nodes that have exactly one child and then just delete them and replace them with like a single node. So the new quad tree that we're going to use will look something like this. All right. And this, whoops, this data structure is called a compressed quad tree. Right, so the idea is we take something to look like that and then replace it with something that looks like this. Right, by just killing off all the intermediate levels. All right, and the rule for compressing the tree is really simple, uh, which is that we'll just look for any nodes which have exactly one child and replace them with their child. So you can do this by just doing some top-down traversal of the tree. So this is the concept. So the compression idea is replace every node with exactly one child with its child. And we just do that starting from the root going all the way down, killing off all these extra nodes. And so uh, here's basically the punchline. Compressed quad trees are practically as good as fair split trees. So from the perspective of the well-separated pair decomposition, you can just build one of these compressed quad trees, feed that into that algorithm that we went through yesterday, and it will basically work. Right? That's the sort of quick and dirty, easy way to build a well-separated pair decomposition. So you can just build this thing by just inserting these points into the compressed quad tree, and then when you're all done, uh, that's it. Right? You, know, you can just read it right out. Uh, there's a kind of slight catch here, though, which is that we still have to build this regular quad tree here, which is of size n log phi as an intermediate step. So what we would like to do is maybe uh, shave off this log phi factor for this intermediate tree that we have to construct. And in doing this, it will be useful to introduce a couple of alternate ways of looking at a quad tree. So these are all still the same basic data structure. Like Nothing is going to change here. It's the same stuff. It's just another way of arranging the data that's in a quad tree that might be slightly more efficient or easier to analyze. Right. So, OK, so let's erase some stuff here. And I'm going to draw uh, a picture. Can the height change slightly if you compress as well? Um, the height can still be up to log phi, right, in the worst case. Right? You can shrink the height, possibly, right? but in the worst case, it could still be log phi. Right? In fact, one thing that you can actually say is that the height would be the minimum of log phi and n. Right? 
So you can, have a height, you can never have a height that'll be bigger than order n when you compress the tree. But it could still just be a straight line, right? So it doesn't, uh, compression doesn't guarantee that the tree become, or becomes balanced. It just guarantees that this log phi stuff doesn't get too out of control. That's really what compression does. And that's actually the key to making quad trees really efficient if you want to you know, actually start using them for stuff. So, right. OK, so let's, let's look at three alternate ways to think about quad trees. Right? And what we're going to do is consider a very dense quad tree. And so in some sense, like maybe the intuition behind a quad tree is that we can think of it as something like a hierarchical grid. Right? This is not a precise concept, but it's just an intuitive idea. So we'll think of this thing as like sort of hierarchical grid. It's like a grid of grids all nested on top of each other. So imagine we take a set of points which are just densely, uniformly packed into a plane, like this. Right? I guess I'll just fill it all in here. Uh, there's going to be 64 of them, so it'll take me a little while to draw this whole thing. But I'd like to have a couple of levels in my tree. So, I'm just doing this for the sake of an illustration here. Right? I mean, this idea will still work, you know, even if your tree is not fully dense. All right. So, three other ways that we can look at it. Right. So let's start by considering. Uh, a dense quad tree. Right? This is basically one where all uh, leaves are filled totally. So if we draw this thing and start out here, I guess I need to put another row of these little dots. There we go. And we'll just subdivide this thing all the way down ad nauseum. Right. And keep going all the way down to the bottom. All right. So suppose we had such a thing, right? So we have this quad tree. It's completely dense, packed all the way out there, right? So what would happen if we did an Euler tour of this tree, or an in-order traversal? So that is, we start at this root node of this tree, we walk down to each of the children, and then pop back up, you know, and then record the order in which we visit them. So the question is, so given such a tree, what order will the points be visited in an Euler tour? So to recall, you know, the Euler tour, right, it just visits every vertex of a graph, uh, or every edge of a graph exactly twice. So you visit it once going out and then once coming back. I um, guess I should probably draw this thing a little bit bigger. So I'll just draw the top few levels of this thing. Also looks like my marker is starting to die. All right. Let me get another one. So an Euler tour of a graph, you know, if we start at the root, it'll basically go something like this. It'll go down here, down here, visit this leaf node, come back up, visit that node, come back down, visit the next leaf, that one, and so on. All right? So it's some kind of path like this, right? So what happens if we do an Euler tour of this grid? Well, we'll start here at this root. Let's suppose we jump up to this quadrant. So we're always going to visit the quadrant, you know, say, this order, right? So just lexicographically within a node. So we start at the, the root. We visit this quadrant. Then we visit this quadrant. Then we get to this leaf. So we get here. Then we pop up, visit here, then here, then here. Then we next visit this quadrant here. So we visit this node, 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 this node. All right, so I'm just doing the in order traversal of this quad tree, right? You all see what's happening? All right, so we now get to the next side, pop all the way down here. 
right? Like that. So you see I'm getting this kind of like weird fractal curve with a bunch of z's in it. All right, so this curve here represents an in-order traversal of the points within the quad tree, right? Just packed out densely. So this traversal of the quad tree is called a z-curve, right? Or a z-order traversal of the point set uh, because it makes a bunch of z's, right? Like that's all, it's just like a bunch of z's like fractally nested inside each other. So we have this concept where we have a z-order curve, which is the same as a uh, in-order traversal of quad tree, or also called an Euler tour. Right? They're all the same thing. OK, so that's kind of interesting. And it suggests maybe an alternate way that we could think about quad trees. So suppose we just stored these points in z order, right? Then we could just have like a list of the, the points within the tree. And then all we would need to be able to do to find you know, the nodes inside this quad tree would be to compute their ancestors in some way. right? So, so there's another way that we can think about a z order for one of these points. right? Um, and this way is maybe a little more, um, I don't know, I guess numerical right, is the way to say that. So to do this, like, let's um, number this axis out here. So we'll start by writing the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate for each point in this plane in binary. All right? So working in binary, if we write the coordinate for this line, this is going to be 0 0.1. Right? This will then be 0 0.01. This will be 0 0.11. All right, so this blue line right here. This line here is now 0 0.001. This line is 0 0.011. This line is 0 0.101. 0 0.111. All right. And we can do the same thing here for y. So we have 0 0.001, 0 0.1. 010, 0.11, 0 0.10, 0.11, 0.101, 0.101, 0.101, 0.111, 0.111. Okay. So uh, if we're given um, some in order traversal of these points like this, and actually I want to do one thing, which is I actually want to flip the order of the y bits here. I actually want to start from the top going down. So we'll do the same thing here. 011, 0 0.10, 0.01, 0.10, 0.11, 0.111. All right, so let's look at the coordinates for each of these points right, as we walk through this grid. So for this point here, this has x coordinate 0, 0, 0, y coordinate 0, 0, 0. And it's the first point in the z traversal. Then the next point here, we basically go you know, one bit over on the uh, like least significant bit in x. Right? And then that matches up to the next point. Right? So, so if we number these points in the order in which we visit them here, um, and I'd like to get a little more space, this point here gets visited, uh, I guess we'll just write it like this. So write a 0, 0, 0. I'll just write the last few bits, actually, for this point. So this is point 0, 0, 0. This point here is visited at 0, 0, 1. This point is visited at 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on. So if we go to this next point, this becomes the point that's at 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and so on through this whole grid, right? I guess I better just continue this out, right? I already started this crazy mess, so we'll just go through 100, 100, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Now, if you look at this, right, the components of these bits up here are 
the x and y components of the bits for the coordinates for each of these points just interleaved. All right? So here is another way that we can think about a z-order curve, is that we are just interleaving the bits of the x and y components of each point. So another, what? So I'll explain this. All right. So by interleaving, suppose I have this point. Like I want to figure out at what point I'm going to visit this point. So what if I have the coordinate 1.100, and for this, you know, x, and I have this, you know, y component here, which we'll write as say uh, 0 0.011, and I want to compute the coordinate where I would visit this point in the z order. All right. Assuming that it's totally densely packed. Then what I can do is I can just take the x components and the y components and just mix the two bits together. So I can create a new bit string, which will look like 1, 0, 0. So taking this bit here, this bit here, this bit here. And then I can take the y components. I'll put a 0 there, a 1 there, and a 1 there. All right, so I'm just mixing the two bits in between each other. So this is this bit interleave operation. And then this would just be the. Uh, the z index. So I can compute the z order, or the z index of one of these points, right, in such a way uh, by just interleaving the x and y index of two bits. Right? So this is the alternate way that you can think about what a quadtree does, right? which is that it's basically uh, like sorting these points in a sense. Well, it's not quite sorting, right? but it's, it's like um, using this interleaving of the x and y bits in order to build this tree, right? But uh, what it does, though, is that if we have you know, like one point in here, then we basically collapse that whole tree down. And so really, uh, what's actually going on in a quad tree is that we're storing a data structure called a try on the bit interleavings of the x, y components of each vector. So the sort of secret identity of a quad tree is that quad trees are actually tries, are tries on the interleavings of the coordinate uh, bit strings. All right, so does everyone here know what a try is, right? Like a T-R-I-E, try. All right, there we have one guy, but they're maybe not as common. You might not see them in an undergrad course on algorithms, right? But basically, a try is a data structure for storing a set of strings um, in some compact, more efficient way than like a hash table, right? So what a try does, so this is sort of an aside here. All my markers are dying today, so it's bad luck. Uh, this basically stores a set of strings. All right, and the basic idea is that if you want to say, you can think of them as something kind of like a finite automata, right? But they're a tree, right? Instead of having like loops backwards inside this uh, set. So store one there, B0, zero, one, zero. So this would basically uh, store the set of strings. Um, maybe put like a little dot here for each of these terminals. So this stores the set of strings 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Right? So the, the basic idea is that uh, a node in a try has, say, two children. I mean, we're working with basically a binary alphabet, which is like all that we need to work with here anyway. Uh, zero, no, because I also have this tree, one, zero. I, so I have oh. three strings, right? So this string here corresponds to the string zero, zero, zero. This corresponds to the string zero, zero, one. This is one, zero, one, one, right? So those are all the strings that I have stored inside this try. So the vanilla try data structure is basically what you get if you uh, store at each node inside this thing, you know, each one of two possible children. We either have like the zero string or the one string for the two sub-bit strings. And um, 
you can basically you know, test membership by walking down this tree. So if I want to check if the string is inside this tree, I just start at the root, and then I just read off the bits as I walk down the tree. Um, the vanilla try data structure, you have one link for each node inside this tree. But there is a compressed try, or they're also called Patricia tries, or Radix tries, or when you're working in base 2, they're sometimes called crit bit trees. I guess I can just write this down, right? And what these do is they just compress the paths, right? Which is exactly what we have in a compressed quad tree. So we have uh, Radix tries. I think that's the most common name. They're also called Patricia tries. They're, they're exactly the same data structure. They just have different names. There's nothing fancy. They're sometimes called crit bit. I don't know why it has so many things. I don't know. Um, yeah. So here is sort of the, uh, the concept, is that quad trees are just tries on the bit interleavings of the coordinates, right? And compressed quad trees are Patricia tries on the bit interleavings of the two strings. So the punchline is that if you want to build a compressed quad tree very fast, you just pull out your favorite crit bit implementation, and then you just feed the bit strings from the interleavings of your points into this uh, you know, crit bit tree. And there you go. Done. You now have your quad tree built very quickly. And you can actually just use that crit bit tree you know, just walking through each of those subdivisions as a complete drop and replacement for your fair split tree. So that's the easy, cheapo construction algorithm for building a well-separated pair decomposition. Um, yeah. So there are other things that you can do with quad trees, right? And with compressed quad trees. Um, time here. Yeah, so the first of these that we're going to look at is, um, uh, I guess, a slight modification of this idea. So we're going to imagine that instead of storing points on the quad tree, we're going to store regions inside the quad tree. Uh, this data structure is not the best solution for this problem, but it's easy to implement and it's simple to explain, right? So, um, but is everyone okay with this right now so far? All right, so this is all good. We all kind of get the Z order interleaving thing. Or actually, or should I say something about how you construct this interleaving? So this is actually kind of a subtle point. Um, before I move on, I can actually say something about how we interleave two bits. So you can do this actually really efficiently for any number of bits on like a modern computer using sort of bit manipulation tricks. I don't know uh, if you guys want to see that or not. Or, uh, we, we'll skip it. Okay. You can look it up online, though. It's pretty easy. <sighs> All right. Um. Right, so yeah, so we're going to look at regions. So this is sort of a region quad tree. A uh, region quad tree. It's again not region quad tree. It's not quite a perfect data structure, right? We already know how to do this better in 2D, right? So we can use one of those point location algorithms that we've covered so far. And that's superior to this result, right? But this technique is nice in that you can generalize it to 3D. Um, and it can be maybe somewhat simpler to implement, right? If you don't have a library to grab, like, ready to go. Um, but it has drawbacks. So it's basically a point location. Uh, and the time bounds for it are not going to be great. I mean, we're not going to sort of prove very tight bounds on the performance of this thing. Um, but here, and, it, and it's not going to work in all cases. So we're going to need to make a couple of assumptions about our data. So suppose we have, um, you know, n planar regions. I'm just going to work this through in 2D. Uh, it's up to you if you want to try to generalize it. And planar regions, where uh, we'll say no vertex has more than d plus 1 incident edges. And um, we're going to need to make some kind of like bounded spread type requirement. So we're going to say that um, no or has more than D 
I guess we're going to say we'll require no more than d incident edges. Uh, no d plus 1. Uh, or I guess we need blind segments, right? So we'll say segments are more than, I don't know, epsilon part, right? Or, I'm not going to worry about this right now, right? This is just to, what I would like to do is basically prevent this situation where we have a bunch of like little line segments that are all packed really close to each other, right? So here is the basic concept, is that we just insert these line segments into the quad tree, and we keep subdividing until we get to cells which have at most d plus 1 edges inside them. So it's basically, here's the construction procedure. Insert segments into quad tree. Stop when uh, a leaf has less than d plus 1 segments. I mean, the reason we have to put this condition in there, right, is that if you had like a vertex which had you know, a ton of segments coming off of there, and you stick that, you know, edge into the uh, quad tree, you can just keep refining this over and over again, and it's never going to terminate, right? So no matter how far you drill down and how fine you make the resolution, there's always going to be, like, some uh, more work to be done in order to totally resolve that, right? So that's why we have to, you know, put this kind of requirement in there. Uh, The other stuff is just to make sure that the tree doesn't become unbounded, but we're not going to worry about that, right? So the basic idea is that every node in the quad tree is going to be either uh, some internal node, right, which will be completely contained inside one of these regions, or it's going to cover some set of line segments, right? And the number of line segments that it'll cover will be at most d plus 1. So it's finite, bounded, whatever. All right, so here's sort of a picture. I have like a bunch of these maps. So I just keep subdividing until each of these boxes covers you know, every map boundary cell perfectly, something like this, right? That's the idea. So you just refine and refine and refine near the boundary, and then terminate when you get fed up with constructing this thing. OK, so that's the idea. Then if I want to locate a point, all I have to do is find which of these terminal cells contains my point, right? And then I can just, you know, check against each of the line segments if there are any, you know, using a vertical ray query, for example, and then classify my point into the, uh, the cell there, right? So that's the, the conceptual idea, right? So it's basically, if I can just locate which leaf contains my point, I'll be done. Now, there's a slight catch, right? Because this tree might not be even anywhere close to being balanced. It could take me a long time to find that leaf. All right, so suppose that after I'm all done with this, right, uh, I finally terminated with the tree of size m and that m wasn't too big. All right. So suppose we do this and get a tree of size m, then how do we locate a point in the tree? That's the question. So I have this tree. I've refined it down into like all these like little bits and pieces. And I like say, take a point, stick it in there. I now want to locate which of these cells contains that point. The tree might not be balanced, so I can't just do some root-to-leaf traversal of it. That's not going to work. Now, there are two different ways to do this, and I'll show you the first one because it's actually a more general technique, which is useful whenever you're working with unbalanced trees. And this is a concept called a finger tree. So have you guys ever heard of finger trees or this technique before? No? Okay, so this is a new thing. All right. So finger trees. And this technique is useful not just for quad trees, but for other things like bounding volume hierarchies or other variations of these types of tree data structures when you want to locate a point inside them. And the tree might not be balanced. So this is finger trees. (laughs) 
finger trees. We want to locate a point, but tree might not be balanced. So what we're going to do is instead of sticking with just our ordinary crappy tree that we started with, we're going to build a brand new tree on top of it, and this new tree will be balanced. And then we're going to basically use that new tree to do our search on top of the older tree. All right, that's the concept. So, so we've built some crazy partition of space or whatever, and we want to locate this thing in the bottom. All right. So the concept is build a new tree on top of old unbalanced tree. And we're going to use the new tree to do that, right? And so this will basically work when each of our subtrees happens to be contained properly inside each node. So we can imagine that we have you know, some sort of like recursive refinement of space, maybe. So we have, like say, some nesting hierarchy of boxes or sets or intervals or however you want to look at it. Then you can use this technique, right? It will work, though, in the case of quad trees, which is the one that we're talking about now. So we're going to stick with that. <coughs> All right. So the basic way that we do this is that we have to find a vertex in this tree, which will allow us to cut it into roughly two equally sized pieces. And so this is a separator, right? So um, let me write the definition here precisely. Um, all right. OK. So let T be a tree with n nodes. A separator is a vertex v in this tree, or some node, whatever, such that um, if we remove v from t, the result is a forest with each uh, component at most uh, n over 2 uh, in size. So that is, if I cut out this vertex, then the resulting thing that I'm left with all of the parts are going to be no bigger than half of n. All right. Um, so that's the definition. Let me show you a picture of how this might work. Right. So imagine I have you know some linked list. Right. You know, with a bunch of crap hanging off of it here. All right. Well, then the separator would just be the middle of this list. So if I break the middle of this list and cut it over there, then I'm left with two separate lists. All right. So that's the idea. Similarly, if I had a balanced tree, then the separator is just going to be the root of the tree, right? So there's like nothing to do there. So I just cut the root, done, right? That'll leave me with the two subtrees, and that's easy. So this is the concept of a separator in a tree. And this is a data structure you see frequently, right? So this general concept is called a finger tree. It's not specific to quad trees. All right. So here is the, the punchline, right? I guess I'll just write it as a theorem. Uh, every tree has a separator, and it can be found in order and time. So it's easy to find a separator. And then once we found the separator, then we can split it into two pieces. So this is pretty much like all that we need in order to build one of these separator trees. And the way you, build, the way you construct this separator is kind of obvious, right? So 
will basically give you a proof or slash algorithm, right? It's just two in one. Which is we work uh, bottom up. You know, so starting from the bottom of the tree, we're going to move up to the root, um, track size of each subtree, separator is the first subtree of size at least n over 2. So we just start from the bottom of the tree, keep walking, walking, walking. Eventually, we're going to get to some node, which is at least this big. You cut that node, you're done. Right? You got your separator right there. So from the perspective of quad trees, uh, what's going on here? Well, maybe we have, I'll draw kind of a picture, which is maybe we have some big tree over here with like a bunch of stuff in it, but then there's like a very deep tree in this little corner. So when we compute this separator, what we'll do is we'll find this little subtree, we'll cut it out, and then turn it into two disjoint quad trees. So we'll still have our big quad tree over here, and now we'll just have this like little extra thing. So this is the idea. So this will become the separator for this big quad tree. We'll cut out the little tree, keep it to the side and over there. So uh, how do we um, use this thing to build a finger tree, right? Well, the basic idea is you start from the initial you know, dense, unbalanced tree. You compute a separator, cut the tree into two pieces. So you locate the separator, kill that, right? Then for all of the children which are left in that separator, you recursively build finger trees for each of them. And then you do it again for this a uh, big tree that's left, right? Each of these pieces is at most size n over 2, right? And so the total cost of building this whole thing is just t of n plus, or t of n is equal to, you know, uh, say, number of children, which are all going to basically sum up to something like less than n over 2. In this case, if we assume that they're a binary tree, which would be if we used a crit bit tree to simplify it, it'd be 2 times t of n over 2 plus the cost of building a separator, which is order n. And this is just an n log n construction time. The size of this resulting structure that we get will just be order n. All right, so we can build this thing relatively efficiently, and then storing it is no big deal. Um, so once you have one of these finger trees, how do you use this to speed up point location? Well, what you do is you take the point that you want to locate, and you first search in the smaller of the two trees. All right? If it is contained in that smaller tree, you recurse through there. Right? Otherwise, you then perform the lookup on the larger tree and return that result. Why does this work? Well, instead of having to search through the entire tree, we're basically cutting through the number of points that we have to search through by half each time. Right? So when we do the search in this way, right, we're no longer having to walk along some potentially arduous path from the root to a leaf. We can now just always cut you know, half of the nodes out each time we run one of these iterations of the search. And so the result is that we'll be able to get to, you know, um, this final terminal node that contains our point in log number of steps rather than order n, possibly. Right? So that's finger trees. It's kind of a neat idea. Uh, it pairs well with a lot of these bounding volume hierarchy or quad tree type uh, objects. Um, OK. So that's that. Any other questions there about that idea? Or no? All right. So, OK. So the last thing, or there, I guess there's two more things. Depending on time, we'll see how far we get with them. But uh, there's one other thing that quad trees happen to be good for. Um, this point location thing might be a little bit dubious. Perhaps you're not convinced by it or not. But this other one is actually a good idea, right? This is a thing that quad trees can do better than other similar data structures. And this is approximate nearest neighbor queries. Um, so let me explain how this works. So we've already seen how to do nearest neighbor queries in 2D. And we've seen these all nearest neighbor queries, right? which are basically when we're looking for every uh, point's nearest neighbor in some set of points. But this would be a little bit different. This is a situation where. Maybe we're working in some low dimensional space, say three or four, 
Um, and we'd like to find, for any given point, the closest query point in this set of points you know, that we started with. Right? Um, in 2D, we know how to do this optimally, right? which is we just use Voronoi diagrams and point location. Right? So that solves that problem. I mean, many problems in 2D will just boil down to compute Voronoi or Delaunoy triangulation, and you're done. Um, but in 3D, that's not an option because, as we know, it's too big. Um, it turns out, in 3D, it's actually pretty hard to do uh, nearest neighbor queries efficiently, or at least I know of no easy, simple answer that will get you there all the time. And so instead, what you often have to settle for is something which is maybe not quite as good as a perfect exact nearest neighbor query to any given test point, but you're willing to make do with some kind of approximation to a nearest neighbor query. And that's what we're going to look at right now, is approximate uh, nearest neighbor queries uh, in lowish dimension. So in low D. All right. So what is an approximate nearest neighbor, right? In what sense could we say something is an approximate nearest neighbor? And after all, something is either a nearest neighbor or it isn't. Um, well, the basic idea is that, um, well, OK, so let's, let's define what this is, right? So we'll say let P uh, contained in RD be a set of n points. Uh, fix a query point Q in RD. Then S in P is a one plus epsilon approximate nearest neighbor to Q. Right, so this is the, the definition. If the distance between Q and S is less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon times the distance between Q and T, for all t in p. All right, so it basically means that um, some point, you know, s here happens to be almost a good enough nearest neighbor, right? Um, right, and I should also say uh, we also need to fix an epsilon greater than zero, right? So this thing has to be strictly bigger than zero, and we'll also require it to be less than one, right? So it's somewhere between zero and one, some tiny number. Right, so imagine I have like a bunch of points out here, and I take a point here, call this Q. Maybe my nearest neighbor is right there, but perhaps this one here is close enough. Right? So that's the idea. So we'll basically uh, settle for not maybe finding the perfect exact nearest neighbor, but finding one that's close by to the nearest neighbor. That's the idea. So this is the approximate nearest neighbor problem, uh, which we're going to abbreviate as ANN or 1 plus epsilon ANN problem. Find any 1 plus epsilon ANN to Q. Um, that's basically what it is, right? And we'll basically uh, pre-process P to support these types of queries efficiently. And since we're talking about quad trees today, I think it's probably a reasonable guess that that's the data structure that we're going to use to do this. So, um, right, and a couple of words here first, right, that this only really makes sense in D equal three or four, right? In D equal two, you wouldn't even bother with this. You would just use Voronoi diagrams. So, okay. So that's the, uh, the definition there. Are there any questions about that at all? Or well, hopefully on the same page here. All right. All right, so let's look at how we can use 
a quad tree to solve this problem. So I'm going to erase this here. And I'm just going to write out the algorithm. And then we'll prove why it works and why it's actually kind of fast. I mean, of course, the algorithm's performance will depend on epsilon. If we make epsilon very small, then the algorithm will uh, basically take longer. If we make epsilon very large, then it'll be really quick. All right. Uh, and without loss of generality, assume all of our points, again, are sitting inside uh, that unit square, right, or a unit hypercube. So here's how this will work. I guess I'll use a blue marker. All right. So we're going to write this algorithm as a n n of q. And it's going to take as input the root of the quad tree t. So this is the root node of our whole tree. Um, and we're also going to assume that our tree is augmented with the following data. So we're going to augment quad tree nodes t with this uh, property, which we'll call rep of t. Uh, that is just any point, any point in t. All right, so we'll basically just take you know, each of the nodes in our quad tree, and we're going to assume that we have some constant time lookup table or whatever that just gives us the node associated to that point in the quad tree. So this t would be basically like some compressed quad tree that you would build. And so the basic idea is that we're going to expand the nodes of this tree using something like a Dijkstra type algorithm, you know, starting from the root and then flowing outward to the leaves, right? Um, using a heap, right, or some priority queue. So uh, we're going to initially keep track of the closest point as the representative element of t, right? So closest is the closest point that we found so far as we've searched through the tree. Um, and we're going to keep track of the distance to the closest point, which we'll call r sub cur, right, or r closest. And this is just uh, the distance between q and rep t. And then we have this q of things which we need to visit. So we'll call the q to visit. And we're going to initialize this with you know make heap or whatever of uh, basically the pair r cur and t, right? So it's basically just like a heap of nodes keyed by their distance you know to q, right? So okay, so here's the algorithm. So we'll say well, uh, not our well to visit is not empty, right? Uh, um, we're going to basically pop the top of the tree off. So we'll basically take out the current highest priority node, or the current closest node. So we'll set w equals uh, pop of to visit. And then if um, q minus rep w minus the diameter of w. So we're going to also, for each of these quad tree nodes, keep track of the diameter of this, right? So you can think of this as just like the width of the cell you know, that contains it. Or if we also augment them with a bounding box, we could calculate the diameter. Essentially, we're just treating it as a fair split tree, really. Like, that's what's actually going on. So if the diameter of w is greater than or equal to 1 minus epsilon over 2 times our current best guess, um, then we're just going to skip this node. We won't even expand it. So don't bother. Just toss it. All right. OK, otherwise, we're going to have to blow up this node and then search through all of the children that are inside it. So we'll say for every child, C in the children of W. Um, let's basically check if the distance to C is currently better than our best known distance so far. So we'll check if um, Q minus rep C 
is less than our cur, then we're going to basically update our closest point in our current uh, best radius. So we'll set our cur becomes uh, q minus rep c. So the distance between q and c is representative. And then our current closest point will become rep c. All right. And when we're all done, we're going to basically push c onto this q. So we'll basically do push to visit c. Um, or we'll add it as basically this pair uh, c minus rep, q minus rep c. And then c. And when we're all done with this whole loop, we're going to basically return the closest point that we found. So that's the idea. Um, all right, I guess this should also take the parameter epsilon here, too. Whatever. OK, so that's the idea. Hopefully, this makes some sense, right? So the sort of intuition right, is that we're starting from the root of the tree, and then we're just expanding out the nodes in the tree as we walk down it until eventually we get to you know, some terminal point right, where basically we're no longer able to expand it. And basically, we'll skip that node. So we basically keep searching, searching, searching until uh, we basically decide that we're not going to expand them. All right, so, so the first thing to sort of prove right, or argue about this algorithm is that this does actually compute a 1 plus epsilon approximate nearest neighbor, which may or may not be obvious right away. Um, but the basic reason that that works right, is this right here. Which is, um, and let me draw a picture to sort of illustrate it. Which is that a node will only get expanded uh, if it might contain a point um, that is at least 1 minus epsilon over 2 closer to q than the current best point encountered so far. So let me draw a picture. Um, this little chunk here. So here's the idea. So imagine this is q. And I'll draw a circle around q that will be of radius uh, r cur times 1 minus epsilon over 2. That is this quantity right here. right? So this is the inner radius. And then the total radius of this thing would just be, say, r cur. So this length here would just be r cur wide. So suppose I have a point here, right, which was the nearest neighbor, but it didn't get expanded. So like, suppose that this point here was actually the nearest neighbor of q. We'll write it as nn of q. All right? So if this point was here, this was the actual like, nearest neighbor, or some point that was like, closer to it than the point that we decided on. So this is maybe, we'll call this one as p. This is the approximate nearest neighbor that we returned. This was the regular point. Then the basic um, argument here, and I'm going to need more space, I suppose. All right, I'll draw it up here on the top. All right, so the basic argument is that if we look at the distance between q and the nearest neighbor of q, so that's the actual closest point, and so suppose that this point here, p, we'll call this uh, rep of w for some intermediate node. So this is the point that we actually found, not the real nearest neighbor. So this distance here has to be greater than or equal to q minus uh, rep w minus the distance from, or actually, um, no, I don't want to make that one rep w. I actually want to make. Let's call this quad tree node here w, and then let's say that this point here is rep w. OK, that's the actual point there. right? So this is the way I want to actually do it. I want to make this w that rep w. So here, this has to be bigger than q minus rep w minus rep, the distance between rep w and then the nearest neighbor of q. Which 
this distance here, right, that is at least the diameter of this box, right? So this thing better be greater than or equal to the diameter, because I'm subtracting that. So this is diameter of w. So this is q minus rep w minus the diameter of w right there, which is greater than or equal to 1 minus epsilon over 2 times our cur. You know, because that's where this loop invariant comes from. So this means that whatever the distance was to the nearest neighbor of q, it has to be greater than or equal to 1 minus epsilon over 2 times the current best uh, parameter we found so far. So that means that q minus the nearest neighbor of q divided by 1 minus epsilon over 2 is greater than or equal to our cur. And because, I'm running out of space here, so this is sort of an aside here, right? But it's you know basic fact that 1 over 1 minus epsilon over 2 is greater than or equal to 1 plus epsilon for any epsilon greater than 0 and less than 1. So for all you know, 0 less than epsilon less than 1, this is true. Right? So the conclusion of this is that the point that we returned was actually a 1 plus epsilon approximate neighbor, nearest neighbor. So that basically means that our cur at the end of the whole loop is less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon uh, times the you know, proper distance between q and p. Right? So this is the distance between the two sets. So that means that, indeed, this point that we found you know, uh, from doing this whole process was a 1 plus epsilon approximate nearest neighbor. So the algorithm is correct. It checks out. Right. You know, and it's basically just because we always keep expanding the nodes here. All right. So, okay, so hopefully that's clear enough, right, that this actually works, right? That's not too surprising. I mean, we could also just do a full traversal of the whole tree, and that would work too, right? The tougher thing is to argue that this does not expand too many nodes in the tree, right? And this is the key that makes this actually like interesting and useful. So here, I will basically give you a kind of abbreviated uh, proof for this. Right? So this is the, um, the reason that this is actually like an interesting algorithm as opposed to just some random thing you know, that just searches through all the points in the tree. And here's the basic idea. So if we think about what's happening to this thing, right, as we walk through the tree here, at each level, right, we're basically searching in some radius, right, or some ball here. And so the number of points that we expand as we do this search at any given level, I mean, up until we get to, say, some cutoff point, is going to be basically bounded, right? So the, the sort of reason that this works, so imagine algorithm expands level by level. So this is, again, thinking of this quad tree as a hierarchical grid. So we can imagine that we're starting first at this coarse level, and then we expand some set of nodes, and then those nodes expand and expand and so on. Right? I mean, we could basically reorder the elements that we visit here so that they would basically be expanded in such an order. Then the claim is that uh, up to the level at which this algorithm terminates, the number of nodes expanded is order 2 to the d. All right, so basically, each time we walk through some level of this tree, we're only going to be looking at nodes within you know, a 2 to the d bounding box around them. Right? Or it'll be something like an order epsilon 2 to the d, something like that. 
that's the idea, right? So how do we prove this, right? Well, I'm, I'm just going to need some more space here, so I'm going to have to erase this algorithm. So I hope everyone has that. Um, all right. So here is the concept. Right. I mean, this is somewhat of a fuzzy statement, right? So you should be maybe like not completely convinced by this yet, but hopefully by the end of this, you will sort of understand what's going on, right? So there's sort of the sort of intuition, right, is that basically this epsilon parameter acts as a cutoff. So what we'll do is we'll basically keep walking down the tree, you know, and always expanding a finite number of nodes each level until eventually we get down to that epsilon level and then we stop, right? And if we pushed further beyond that level, then the number of nodes that we would have to search would just explode and blow up. And so we'd have to search through like a ton of different grid cells, right? But that epsilon is what saves us, because we can terminate the search early. All right. So OK. So here is an observation. Uh, observe that for any node w that was expanded, so for for any w which expands, we have that the diameter of w is less than epsilon over 4 times the distance between q and the point set, which I'm going to abbreviate this here as uh, I'm going to write this now using this notation omega bar. I don't know. It's a standard thing people do. All right. So basically, omega bar is equal to dqp. I just don't want to keep rewriting the same thing in all the equations. All right. Um, so that basically means that no node with depth greater than negative log omega bar over epsilon uh, is considered. All right. So uh, nodes. All right. And since the diameter of W is basically in a quad tree, right? We know that the depth of W is basically less than or equal to log base 2 of the diameter of W, right? This is basically assuming a unit box. So if we have this, um, we should make a seal of that thing, right? Because basically each of these things is a power of 2 in size, right? So I have these boxes here, right? So the first level, each of these boxes are size 1 half. Next bot level, they're all size 1 quarter, and so on. So this is just take the log base 2 of that number and then round up. All right. So this basically means that, um, so we have this and this. So the maximum depth is um, this should actually be negative log, right? Because it's a negative 2 value over there. So negative log base 2 of omega bar epsilon over 4. All right, so we'll never go farther than this level of depth into the quad tree, right? So the fact that we picked a parameter epsilon, and given the distance between the two closest pair of points, this puts some termination bounds on when this thing is going to uh, basically stop. Right? So we're never going to drill all the way down to like the very end of the tree unless we make epsilon very tiny. So OK. So now what we'll do is we'll just say, OK, so consider a node containing uh, the nearest neighbor of Q. All right. Now this is basically some node which ends up getting expanded. All right. Then basically the distance, we'll call this node U, right? So the distance between Q and then rep of U is less than or equal to the distance between p and q, right, the closest pair, plus the diameter 
of u, which is equal to omega plus square root of d times 2 to the negative i. All right, so this is just using the size of them. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll say that basically if um, I don't want to put a bar on you, right? So this diameter u, right? We're basically using the inverse of this proposition here in order to put like a bound on the diameter. I guess I should say it's less than or equal to this property over here. And we'll call this parameter here L sub i, right? So this is sort of like the extreme bound on the distance between any pair of nodes, right? So as we're walking down this tree, going from level to level to level, the distance to any node that we expand at level i uh, has to be at most this parameter, right? Or it has to basic. There's some bound on how, you know, small these things can actually get, right? Um, so only cells uh, with distance at most L sub i from Q at level i get expanded. So this is the thing, right? So basically, as we walk down this thing, using the fact that we're going to basically stop at some point when epsilon you know, becomes too big, right? Um, at each intermediate level, we're only going to expand these things which are within this uh, square root of d times 2 to the negative i. That's the diameter of one of these blocks times the closest point within that cell, right? So here's a picture. Right, we have some grid here, which we can imagine are all of the cells at level i. We have our point q. And so we have this box of side length L sub i. And we're only going to be looking at the points which happen to, or the, we're only going to be expanding the cells which are contained in this box. So how many cells are going to be inside that box? All right, that's really what we would like to bound. If the number of cells contained inside that box is constant, are basically bounded within you know, each level that we look at, then the number of operations that we have to do per level of the tree is bounded. Right? That's what we want to do. Is we want to make sure that we can't pack too many of these boxes into this square of size L sub i. Now, it could be that maybe you know, L sub i is very large or this grid is very fine. Right? You know, this would happen in the case where maybe the closest point was very far away. Right? So this point would be way over there. And so we'd have to search through a huge number of boxes. Right? But if the point is closer, then we can basically stop sooner, right? You know, the reason that we won't ever get to this place where basically Q is here and then the closest point is very far away and then we have to search a bunch of points is that then this parameter or this approximation factor will kick in and then we'll be able to terminate before we have to search over all of the points within that giant box, right? So what this means is that at level i, the number of points that we have to search is order uh, 1 plus 2 to the i omega. All right, so, so this is kind of the punchline here. So we'll say at level i, uh, the number of cells searched is order 1 plus 2i omega bar to the d. All right, that's the, uh, the point, right? Is that basically we have this box of length 2l, so the number of cells that we could possibly pack into there at this level, each of these cells is uh, basically like 1 over l distance, is 2i to the dl times omega, right? So we have this L here, we have to scale it by omega and then march through it. There's 2i, right? Yeah. So it's basically Li divided by 2 over i, right? So the, the number of cells searched, another way of thinking about this is that it's 2 times uh, L sub i over 2 to the negative i minus 1, something like that, right? So this is sort of the number of cells searched.
which is not so bad, right? So this is the, these are sort of the two things that we know, right? So we know how far down we're going to go in the tree. So this is how many levels we're going to search, right? And we know that at each level, we're never going to search more than this many cells. Right? We might search much less. Right? It would be you know, great if we did. But we know in the worst case, it'll never get any bigger than that. So I'm just going to finish this up very quickly now. And we'll just kind of combine these two facts. So let me erase all of this right now. And then I'm going to kind of finish it up. All right, so here are the two facts that we know. Uh, we first visit no more than uh, log base 2 of omega bar epsilon over four levels in the tree. And um, at each level, uh, we expand at most uh, order 1 plus 2 to the i uh, omega bar to the d nodes at each level i. All right, so these are the two facts that we have. So the total number of nodes that we will expand, which is basically the running time, right? So the total number of nodes visited is the, on the order of the sum from i equals 0 to that thing, which is log omega bar epsilon over 4. Um, times 1 plus 2 to the i omega bar to the d, which if we expand this out, right, uh, the one we can just pull out from the sum. And so that's just going to become that log factor, right? So it's going to be, we can forget the ceiling thing, right? So it just becomes log uh, omega bar uh, Epsilon, or it's actually negative log, right? So it's a negative log, negative log, right? So this will actually just simplify down into 1 over omega epsilon. Uh, and then this thing here, well, we basically have a 2 to the i here. And then we have a log over here. So we can you know, just sum them up. And that will end up being uh, plus omega over omega epsilon all to the d, which if we simplify all of this down, gives us the final bound for the running time of this search, which is order log. Because uh, we can pull off the 1 over epsilon factor. It's dominated by that thing. So this becomes log of 1 over the distance between the closest pair. I'll kind of replace this thing now with dqp plus 1 over epsilon to the d. So there you go. That's the time complexity of this crazy algorithm for searching points in a quad tree. So um, a few notes on this, right? It's dependent on two parameters, which is the distance to the closest point, right? And then this parameter epsilon that we pick. So if we make epsilon smaller, then we might have to search a lot more nodes in this tree because we have to basically search on this larger shell expanding out from the closest point. And, uh, it's dependent on the closest distance, right? So if the distance to the point that we're searching is actually very, very small, then the algorithm will take longer because it will have to expand more levels of the quad tree, right? Whereas if it's farther away, the recursion will terminate sooner, right? So I think that's pretty much everything I want to say about quad trees. Um, yeah. All right, that's that.